Turn to Romans and chapter 13. Book of Romans, chapter 13. from verse 8, Romans 13 and verse 8. It says, Owe oh, nothing to anyone <coughs> except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbour has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not cover. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this, saying, You shall Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbour. Love therefore is the fulfilment of the law. And this do, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, the day is at hand, let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. I want to think a little bit this morning about knowing the time. Knowing the time it says here in this passage, knowing the time. It's time to awaken. It's time to be <coughs> awake. There are different references to time. There's two different ideas to this uh, thing of time. There's the one which probably most of us think of, which is chronos, which is chronological. And we like to put time in a line, don't we? And, and so many people um, regarding the return of Jesus, they want it all in a nice straight line. They want it in order. They want to know when Gog Magog is. They want to know when this is and when, when the rapture exactly is and, and how it all comes in line. But that's, that's not what Scripture really encourages us to. The Scripture encourages us to know the season, that period of time, that uh, time of year, if you like. It's that time of year at the moment when... Leaves become a pain in the neck, isn't it? It's that time. It's that time. It's not like, whatever, 11.40. It's not that kind of time. It's just that season. It's that period when certain things happen and you're going to have to get the brush and shovel out. It's that. And it's that which the scripture points us to. We should know the time. We should know the season. And what it is, therefore, that we should be doing, because we're living in that season. We're living in that time. The chronos, the, <clears throat> sorry, the kairos, the period, the season. What season is it? What time is it? Well, it's the time when Jesus is coming back. Very, very soon. It's the time when we're looking very soon. To see a man of lawlessness revealed. It's a time when the world is descending into darkness and lawlessness. It's a time where we need to be awake. That's what the scripture says. Knowing the time, we should be waking up. And I want to encourage us to wake up this morning knowing the time. It's that time to be awake, dear friends. It's not the time to be drifting around. It's not a time to be nodding off. We need to be alert. We need to be sober for the purpose of prayer. We need to be watching and praying because Jesus is coming back soon. 
things are moving very, very quickly, and it's that time, it's that season. The harvest is coming soon, yes. and that harvest, dear yes. friends, is the reaping, not of souls to be saved, but God puts in the sickle because the harvest is ripe. The world, dear friends, is full of sin. Mm -hmm. The world is sin sick. And God looks down, His wrath is being stirred, His vengeance for His people is being stirred, mm -hmm. and the sickle's lifted. It's that season where God is going to come and cut down. He's going to come and cut people down. And all flesh is like grass. All its loveliness is like the flower of the field. And God's going to come and cut down so many people in these days. It's that time. The harvest is. The harvest is nearly time. And we need to be living as if we are in that season. And I want us to think a little bit about that this morning. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 <clears throat> A similar kind of um, sentiment here mm. regarding this time and how we need to be awake. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Now as to the times and seasons. epoch seasons, brethren, you've no need of anything to be written to you. Well, I wouldn't say that that was true for the vast majority of the church at the moment. We need an awful lot. There's so many people in ignorance of the season that we're living in. The urgency of the hour. The time is short. You yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night while they're saying peace and safety. Then... Destruction will come upon them suddenly, like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. The warnings are, be ready, be awake. This is a time when destruction's coming, when judgment is coming, when God's vengeance is coming. Tremble all the inhabitants of the earth. The day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty, the prophet says. And we need to have that sense of urgency and being alert because we're living in that time. You say, what time? I want to put, put it in my line. Well, forget the line. Know the season. Know that it's that season. Know that it's that time, dear friends, that Jesus warned of when all the birth pangs are coming thick and fast. Earthquakes and famines and wars and threats of wars. And when there's so many disturbances, there are vast multitudes of people being swept from country to country, destabilizing whole economies and countries. It's that time of lawlessness, of violence. It's that time, dear friends. And we need to be awake because it's that time. The Lord's coming back soon. <clears throat> but you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. You're sons of light and sons of day. Mm -hmm. We're not of night nor of darkness, so then let us not what? Sleep. 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 Similar thing. What time is it? It's time to wake up, dear friends. It's time to be alert and sober for the purpose of prayer. It's time to be urgent about the hour, the time that we're living in, the season that we're living in, because it's like no other coming. Jesus said there's a time of tribulation coming, such as never been for this world. And that's quite a statement in view of what's happened in the past, isn't it? There's a time which is so destructive, so, so awful, dear friends, when God's wrath begins to be poured out in the earth and we should be awake to that we should be alive to that we shouldn't be in darkness we're sons of light God has given us his word we have, we have the spirit of God to keep on reminding us and to wake us up 
that we need we need to watch and pray because the Lord's coming back soon. <clears throat> First Peter and chapter one. Salvation is coming. Mm. You say, well, aren't I saved? Well, I hope you are. I hope you're born again. I hope you're regenerated by the Spirit of God. I hope the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you from all sin and goes on cleansing you from all sin. Mm. I hope you're walking with Jesus more and more each day. But salvation's future as well, isn't it? First Peter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance imperishable and undefiled, which will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven who are protected by the power of God through faith, for what? A salvation which is ready to be revealed in the last time. Salvation is yet to be. The redemption of our bodies is yet to be. You haven't got your redeemed body yet, have you? You haven't got your new body. Your indestructible one. Your imperishable body. No! You're still in that grotty shell, <coughs> aren't you? That earthly tent. And we're looking forward to that day. And we should be awake looking for it. That is what scripture urges us to. And it's so much closer than even the day when you gave your life to Jesus. It's coming soon, dear friends. When the trumpet will sound. And the dead in Christ will be raised. And we shall be saved. We shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to be gathered to him. I, I, I've not seen all the glory of heaven. I've not seen all the, the wonders of my blessed saviour. But I will on that day. Because I'll have eyes that are capable of seeing. And a mind that's capable of understanding all the fullness of his love. And all his wonder and glory. What a day that will be. Amen. Praise God. And we should be living in the expectancy that that day is coming soon. It's terror for this world and it's glory for us. What a privileged people we are, dear friends. Mm -hmm. To have come into this great salvation in Amen. Jesus. What a privileged yes. people. Yes, indeed. And it's a time to wake up. Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says it to a church. Can the church be asleep? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. <clears throat> Revelation 3 verse 1, To the angel of the church in Sardis right here who has the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, says this, yeah. I know your deeds, you have a name that you're alive, <laughs> but you're dead. <laughs> Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, mm. which were about to die. I've, found, I've not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you've received and heard. Keep it and repent. You know, I think I've got a, a word for the people of God in these days. Amen. I don't claim to be a prophet, but I believe I've got a word <laughs> for God's people. It's six letters. Repent. Amen. Repent. <coughs> the Lord said it to five out of seven churches. Yeah. He says it to his people today. Yes. Wake up and repent. Yes. There's a real need for repentance in yes. the people of God. A Amen. complete change in the way that we think. Amen. In the way that we're living. We need to wake up. We need to repent. It's that time, dear friends. So, we need to put on the armour of light. We're not in darkness that that day should overtake us like a thief. We're sons of light and we need to put on the armour of light. Why do you need to put on armour, dear friends? 
because we're in a battle. And we need to understand what that battle is in these days. And I want to just outline a few things for us this morning. Turn to Jude, the book of Jude, while we're in Revelation. Just turn back a few pages. <clears throat> Jude in verse 3, it says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you, what? Contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. There's a battle, dear friends, in these days. There's some wrestling to be done. There's a stand to be made. And what's it to be made for? The faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, it is written, dear friends, it is written. When the enemy came to the Lord, how did he reply? It is written, dear friends, it's written. And it's written once and for all, for all of us. God has given us his word, Thank and it, it is written. Thank you, Father. And it's not to be changed, no. it's not to be added to, it's not to be watered down, it is written. Amen. And we need to contend yes. for the faith, once and for all delivered. Because the, within the body of Christ, which is supposed to be the pillar and support of truth, there is a massive compromise yeah. on the truth. Amen. It's not good enough that it is written for so many people who are claiming to belong to Jesus Christ. And we need... We need to bring that word to the people of God in these days. What word? Repent. Repent. We come across people, dear friends, who you bring the scripture to them and they ah, well, you, we, we need to be loving. We need to be tolerant. No, you need to repent. You need to change your way of thinking. If that's what you're doing, when somebody brings the word of God, you need to repent. And we need to be bold in these days to contend for the truth once and for all written and delivered to the saints. Because the church, dear friends, is almost non-existent. Things that we shouldn't be debating, things that we shouldn't be yeah. discussing, issues. It's madness. Yes. And how did we get here? Oh. Because we're not holding <coughs> to what is written. And the only answer to that is repent. Don't debate people who need to repent, dear friends. Just call them to repent. We need to contend. What else? Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12. Because of lawlessness, what? Most people's love will grow, grow, grow cold. Because this is the season, dear friends, when there's so much widespread lawlessness within the body of Christ, within the church. People who are not standing for the truth, people who are not holding to the truth, there's a lawlessness, anomia, without the law. People's opinions, people's feelings are governing the church. Yes. 
And what's it causing? Division. 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 But most people's love is going cold, dear friends. Believers in Christ are going cold when we should be on fire for Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. What a tragedy. And we need to contend. And we need to pray, dear friends. And we need to encourage and stir up one another to love and good deeds. All the more as the day draws near. Why? Because lawlessness increases. And most people's love will go cold. God forbid, dear friends, that we sit here and watch one another going cold on Jesus. Without seeking to encourage, without seeking to stir up, without seeking to strengthen the saints. Let's take that responsibility, dear friends. And watch and pray. Don't nod off while people are going cold all around you. God forbid. What else do we need to contend for? In these days, dear friends, it's most important. We contend for the truth of God's purpose for Israel. Yes. Yes. In these days, it is important that we contend for the truth of God's purpose for Israel. Yes. For 1900 years, it wasn't a major issue, was it? The times of the Gentiles, Israel wasn't a nation, the Jews were scattered, not too many of them were getting saved. But that's all changed, 1948, 1967. Mm -hmm. We now have a nation, dear friends. Yes. We now have a people that are being regathered. Yes. We now have Israel as a nation in fulfillment of the word of God. Mm -hmm. And why is it so important? Because it's God's timepiece. Yeah, yeah. It is God's timepiece, dear friends. How do we know we're so close to the return of Jesus? Israel. Israel. How do we know that we're so close to the return of Jesus? Because Jews are starting to get saved in significant numbers. The blindness is being removed. The Spirit of God is striving with God's chosen people. And all the nations are out to destroy that people and to destroy that land. Yeah. To take possession of the pastures of God. And it's not an irrelevance within the church, dear friends, in these days. It never really has been. No. Because it's absolutely key to how you look at the word of God. Mm -hmm. Whether you take it as it's written or whether you do somersaults with it. And that's the reality. Amen. And the vast majority of the church, certainly in the West, but probably right across the world, I, I'm, I'm no church expert, so I'm not going to put a figure on it, but the vast majority, dear friends, hold to a doctrine that has Israel replaced by the church. Amen. It's not only folly, but it's dangerous. Amen. And we need to contend against that. We need to bring the word of God we need to remind God's people of the everlasting covenants of our God. Amen, yes. Israel is a nation today because God does not lie and he never changes. Amen. And that's why Israel is not consumed. Yes, amen. And it's God's timepiece to point us to the soon return of the Lord Jesus Christ. What else? Well, we need to stand and contend for these things. What else do we need to do? Romans says we need to love our neighbour. We need to love our neighbour. Jesus told a story about loving our neighbour, didn't he? The Good Samaritan. And it's about a man, he's going the wrong way. He's going to Jerusalem to Jericho. So he's on, he's on the wrong path. Yeah. He should be going up to Jerusalem. You go up to Jerusalem when you're going to worship 
the living God. Well, this man's going the wrong way because he's going the wrong way. He falls among thieves. They rob him. They strip him. They leave him dying. That's what sin does, isn't it? Yeah. What a picture. That is it's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Of what sin does in a person's life. And there we are, dead in trespasses and sins. And along comes religion. Mr. Pharisee. And what does that do for us? I'll tell you, it passes straight by, dear friends. It can't deliver us. It can't bandage us up. It can't heal us. It can't bring us back to God. So it just passes on by. But one who's despised and rejected of men, a Samaritan comes along. It's a picture of Jesus. And Jesus takes this man. Takes him. Puts him in a church. And says, look after this one, I'm coming back, you're going to give an account, I'll pay it, I'll repay it. What a beautiful picture of the gospel, isn't it? Yes. And we're told, love your neighbour. You've got a responsibility, dear friends. You've been entrusted with the message that can touch people's lives. There's a whole multitude all around us who've been stripped by sin and left dying and helpless. And can they save themselves? No. no. They need to hear about the Saviour that if they call upon Him, if they're willing to repent, if they really want to get out of that awful state and be saved, there's one who can do it. And we need to take that responsibility in these days, dear friends. In Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> verse, tw <clears throat> verse 34. The parable of the landowner and the vineyard. And verse 34 says what? When the harvest time approached, what time? Harvest time. Harvest time. Is harvest time approaching? Yes. yes, it is, dear friends. God is going to come and cut mankind down. And multitudes, multitudes are not going to be in the valley of decision. They're not going to be standing up at a Billy Graham conference or anything like that. No. That's not what Scripture's pointed us to. The harvest is God's judgment. Yes. Multitudes, dear friends, are going to be cut down. Put in the sickle. The harvest is ripe. This world is ripe for the judgment of God. And God's judgment is coming. And what does he do at harvest time approaching? He sends slaves, dear friends. He sends slaves. That's what he does. It's that time. What time is it? It's time when the Lord of the harvest wants to send out workers. Are you offering yourself in these days? Because time's running out. And it's that time, dear but as I've said many times, night's coming when no man can work. I don't know when. You want it on a line? You want to know exactly what time? I can't do it for you. But I can tell you the season. And the season is this. The Lord of the harvest is still trying to stir up and Amen. send out workers Amen. while there's still time. Amen. He's still seeking to touch the hearts of God's people with a love for their neighbours. Yes. To go and find dying people on the road. Amen. To bring them to the Saviour. That they might be saved. Amen. It's that time, dear friends. But it's not that time for long. <coughs> it's time to wake up. 
We need to pray for an awakening, dear friends. We need to pray for a reviving of God's people. We need Him, desperately. We need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to empower us for these coming days, like never before. And we need to seek the Lord to revive, revive the people of God. Amen. That's what Amen. time it is. Amen. Wake up. That's what time it is. We need to call upon Him. That He'll pour out His Spirit, that He'll give us a boldness for the preaching of the Gospel. And He'll give us, he'll give us the strength to be able to stand in the midst of this flood of iniquity and lawlessness which is coming. We need it. Pray for reviving. What else is it time for? It's time to lay aside the deeds of darkness. The old things of darkness in our lives. I hope you've not gone back to them. I hope you dumped them. And you've not fished them out again. I know somebody when they got said, they dumped all their DVDs and all their worldly rubbish. They put it all in big black bin liners and everything. Unfortunately, they never got round to taking it down to the charity shop or the dump or whatever. It was still sat in a room. And after about 18 months, guess what? Take again. The black bags came back out. They started fishing around. Oh, well, we've got a few hours to spare. We'll just get out the old things. Don't do it, dear friends. No. Lay aside those deeds of darkness. No. Put on the armour of light. It's a season to be about the Lord's work. Amen. To redeem the time because the days are evil. Behave properly. <coughs> Not in sensuality. Feelings. The church has become touchy-feely. Yes. Do, do you agree? Yes. I hope we're not touchy-feely. I hope we're not hard-hearted. I hope we're not without any compassion. But I, I hope we're not touchy-feely. I just feel that I should... Well, Forget what you feel. What does the Word of God tell you Amen. you should be doing? Amen. The church has become governed by sensuality. <clears throat> Feelings. We're lovers of money rather than lovers of God. We're lovers of self rather than lovers of God. And what else? We're lovers of pleasure, dear friends. We looked at that passage, um, I think in the Bible study or something, I think we might have preached on it recently. Mm -hmm. And the love of money, that, that's pretty easy, isn't it? We preached on that, the right use of money and the right view of money and, and, and all those kinds of things. Self, we, we can get that one, can't we? Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you must. Deny yourself. You must take up your cross. You must follow. Anything to do with self, you've got to get it out of your life. You've got to deny it. You've got to put it away. But what about the pleasure thing? Where does that come in? How can pleasure loving flood the church of God in the last days? And I wasn't so sure. Until a week or so ago, when I saw a message that um, somebody sent <clears throat> on YouTube and it's by Brad Huddleston and I encourage everybody to watch it and it's called Digital Addiction mm -hmm. Digital Addiction watch it dear friends and you'll understand 2 Timothy 3 lovers of, lovers of pleasure how is the devil flooding not only the world but the church with a love of pleasure? Yeah. Digital addiction. Watch it because 
I can't preach it, <coughs> but watch it, okay? Sensuality. One more, <clears throat> or two more. Not in strife and jealousy. We need to watch over our relationships, dear friends, in these days. <clears throat> the enemy <clears throat> wants to destroy the church. Amen? We all know that. Yeah. Why, does he do, why does he want to do that? Because he's the enemy. That's who he is. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. He's never going to change, dear friends. And if he tells you he, he's reformed, <laughs> he was a liar from the beginning. Yeah. He's the father of lies. He's never going to change. He's always out to destroy the people of God. He's always out to destroy fellowships. He's always out to destroy the body of Christ. And what's one of his chief weapons? What's one of the chief wiles of the evil one? Strife and jealousy. Stirring up strife and jealousy among the people of God. Unforgiveness, bitterness, squabbling, all those things. You say, well that would never happen in the church, would it? He never gives up. And so we need to wake up and watch and pray. Turn to Philippians and chapter 2. Being read already this morning. Just a simple exhortation for us all that we avoid giving the devil an opportunity. Paul warns about it, doesn't he? They've got to forgive this man who's he's been in sin and he's been put out and he's repented, he's come back in and he, he needs restoring, he needs accepting, he needs, he, he, he needs building up fully. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's had a bit of a grievance with him needs to put that aside and, 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 and love the man. Yeah? And, and Paul says, don't give the devil an opportunity. Whenever we do not forgive from the heart, dear friends, whenever there's strife, whenever there's contention, when it's not contending genuinely for the truth, then we're giving the devil an opportunity. How do we guard against that? Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with... Humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Who's the most important person here this morning? We, we don't realise it, but dear friends, that's the old nature, isn't it? We walk around like we're the most important person. We have conversations and actually what we've got to say is far more important than this person's. I mean, it's a lot more interesting what I've got to say than what you've got to say. And it's much more intelligent line of conversation. That's how we can be, isn't it? Unless we actively take on this attitude, this mind, the scripture says, have it, practice it, discipline yourself to think this way, when I walk in that door, when we gather together with the people of God, they're more important than I am, I'm taking the lowest seat, and then maybe the Lord will lift me up and do great things in my life because I've taken the lowest seat. Have that mind. Have that attitude. Doesn't come naturally, dear friends. 
You've got to discipline yourself to it. But it's the only way Amen. that we keep strife and contention out of the hearts of God's people. Forgive. That person's more important than you are. Forgive. But you don't know what they've done. Forgive. That person is more important than you are. Forgive. But if you knew what I've been through, forgive. That person is more important than you are. Have that mind in yourself, which was in Christ <coughs> Jesus. It's time, dear friends, it's time to take on that mind and to guard against contention and strife within the body of Christ. Because there's a remnant church left. It's just a remnant difference. How many are contending genuinely for the truth of God's word in these days? For the headship of Christ in his church? For the preaching of the gospel? For going out into all the world and reaching souls for Jesus? He's not got many churches left to destroy, dear friends. But he knows how to do it. So have that mind which was in Christ Jesus. Keep that attitude. One last thing. We're exalted. This is the season. <clears throat> Wake up and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And you're glad. It doesn't say put on the whole armour of God. It means that. Yeah. He is the whole armour of God. But you know when we go through Ephesians 6 and we, we, we go through the different parts of the armour of God and all that, we, we, we can get tied up on a thing, can't we? Mm -hmm. But the reality is, it's a person. My strength to stand in these days depends and relies 100% on my relationship with the Saviour. My walk with Jesus. How closely am I walking with Jesus Christ? I can put on the helmet of the hope of salvation. I can be thinking looking forward to the trumpet sounding, I can, I can be picking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I, I can be trying to wear the breastplate of righteousness and keep my life right, but am I walking closely with Jesus? Because that church in Ephesus, it had it all right, but it had lost the love Time to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's time to live every minute of every day aware of His presence with us. He is Emmanuel. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh. It's that season. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for your word. Amen. Lord, we know it's time to wake up and we, we, we can be lazy, we, we can be negligent in our walk with you. So Lord, would you help us to apply these things to our lives and, and be alert and sober for the purpose of prayer, to draw near to you, to walk with you. And to fervent the love you from the heart. Lord, help us, please, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.